Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the world's biggest stars and legends and icons too. And we've got one for you today. Roy Walker is one of our favourite people. It's great to talk to you again. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. And it's nice to be on your programme. You know, it's so lovely to hear your voice again because I think before your face and before your act and before your comedy, that voice is so identified with you. And that's what we love, isn't it? That warmth, that charm. Have you always had a great voice? Um, I think so. At school, I, could, I was very good at reading and I got all the parts in the different plays and what have you. So, although I don't recognise it as a distinctive voice, I do know that I must have one because people will come up to me in the supermarket when I'm in another aisle and they'll say, I knew you were there because I heard your voice. I knew it was you. <laughs> and I've never really thought about it like that. But there again, after being on the television for like 30 years or something like that, they must recognise it. <laughs> Well, and again, you were part of TV when it mattered. I mean, audiences are so fragmented now and small. When you were on, I mean, it was millions and millions and millions of people night in and night out. It was. I mean, I started off in The Comedians in the late 70s, and like 20 million would watch The Comedians. That's a third of the population. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) Uh, And then uh, moving into the 80s, um, I got a, a game show and what have you, and like, 10, 12, 15 million people would watch a game show on a Saturday night and think nothing of it. And I finished up 15 years later in in 1999 uh, and uh, we still hadn't dropped below 10 million. And by then we had, I believe we had 22% across only 26 channels, but we had 22%. So now there's hundreds of channels, isn't there? Are you glad you're out of it in a way? Because it does seem a rat race now. And I don't think anybody, whether it's your guy who took over your show or anybody else, is ever going to last as long as you did. You did have the halcyon days when TV mattered and that talent mattered and legends were born. Well, I've never really been able to uh, evaluate what I did. You know, I've done hundreds of universities, meet people in the street every single day. And they always say, oh, watch, still watch your old programme and all that business. And I don't know what effect I had on them, but uh, going, I think going into their house every Saturday for 15 years, well, relatives wouldn't do that. So they get used <laughs> to you. And uh, the prizes were good. And the programme, well, it didn't, you didn't need to be a rocket scientist to... Uh, but funny enough, here's a point that I, I tell my audiences. Did you know that all comedians were game show hosts back in the day? And apart from being a comedian, you only needed one other qualification. What do you think that was? Go on. Your first name. It only had to have three letters. Bob, two Bobs. Yes. Two Jims. Yeah. A Les, <laughs> yes. a Des, a Ted. And they said to me, what's your name? I said, Roy. He said, you've got it. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? I never thought of that. And those guys, it is interesting, because if you said Roy Walker now, I think people would go, oh, yeah, he's a game show host. But, of course, you were a comedian far before that, and I think you have to be, because if you're not quick-witted with the public, you're going to fall down pretty quick, aren't you? When, when uh, they finished me off on, uh, on Catch Fears, it was for money. They got somebody that would do it for a tenth the fee or something like that there. And the only real decent phone call I got was from Les Dennis, and he said something very important. He said... But it's comedians that make those shows run, you know? Guess what they're doing nowadays? Comedians are back. (laughs) The modern comedian, but they don't look all that interested, to tell you the truth. They don't seem to chat and and what have you with the punters. I think it's the heart and soul, though, isn't it? I mean, you fundamentally love people, and that's been clear through your entire career, that you are a people person. Well, we are. We're comedians. We like to be loved. You know, and we like to be laughed at, you know, we like the warmth of the laughter. And uh, we don't want to be laughed at unless you're dressed up dead funny with a red nose. But we want to be laughed with, you know. But it's a, it's a great job being a comedian if, if you can do it and if you really like it. Just finally on Catchphrase, help me with you and that program now. I mean, it'll always be your baby. Those clips still fly around with Mr. Chips doing in, inappropriate things with himself. They're wonderful. Can you watch it now or is that done? How do you feel about it? Well, um, I suppose a lot of people who have been on the television regularly would say, no, I don't watch TV anymore. But it's true of me. I'm away all the time. Show business has now moved on to the high seas. I mean, I'm joining tomorrow the Queen Elizabeth 
um, down in um, in Rome, and it, I'll be in a thousand seater theatre tomorrow night uh, with an orchestra, lights, curtains. Where would you find that nowadays? I mean, it's all evaporated from the music hall right the whole way through to the piers, to the shows in London, to the variety bills. But it's still happening on the luxury liners. Like, for instance, what a lot of people didn't understand was is every year I only did catchphrase for a week. I would go down for a week, and within a week we would do 26 programmes in a week. And then they would never say, see you next year. They never said anything like that. You know, they said, well, thanks very much. Your cheque will be in the post, you know, and sure enough, your cheque would come through about a month later. And in the meantime, you went back to doing stand-up. You'd be working clubs, all sorts of things, just exercising your ability as a comedian because if you don't, you lose it. Did you do those shows in Nottingham? I think they were done at Central, weren't they? Well, we did them in all sorts of places. We started off in TBS, uh, and that was in the south coast in Southampton. Uh, And then we moved to... um, hmm, Maidstone in Kent and i tell you how um, pioneer it was the studio was this brand new studio sitting in the middle of a field no houses no pubs <laughs> no hotels we had nowhere to stay I mean all those fields all around us and what so we drove from Maidstone to a little village called Rutum and there was one pub there called The Bull, 14th century pub. And um, they'd never seen anybody from TV or anything like that, you know. And they'd heard about a studio further up the road. No motorways. No, now it's all fast motorways going past it. Or have you. So we stayed there, chickens in the yard. <laughs> now, apparently, in, during the war, uh, a lot of the fighter pilots stayed there. And they would say... Before, leaving on a mission, they always went at night. So they would take the candle and into the white ceiling and they would write their name with the smoke from the candle. Right? And uh, and all their names were there, all those fighter pilots. I went back years later, you know what I mean? Somebody had whitewashed over them. <laughs> <laughs> It's the modern world we live in, you know? What a shame. Well, 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 my name was up there as well. I wasn't a fighter pilot. (laughs) And then we look at you as you sit here now. You seem incredibly well and incredibly fit. How are you? Well, I'm I'm terrific. I can't believe that I'm still doing it, you know? And dare I say without being boasting, you know, you couldn't book me next year. I'm sold out. So I think it's uh, because... The marketplace that of people who go on these luxury liners, uh, they don't want to be insulted. They don't want to be um, hear any bad language or anything. Like that. Well, we were brought up like a, when we were in the worker men's club. You couldn't say the word bloody. That was rude to say that. You know, is it true you'd get money deducted out of your fee if you did swear? There'd be punishments, or is that sort of myth? No, you wouldn't be uh, money deducted. They they might do that, but what they would do is they'd warn you. I mean, the guy with the bell, the concert secretary, would go, <laughs> "Cut out the language. There's ladies in the room." You know, during your act. Oh, during your act, in the <laughs> middle of a joke, maybe your best joke. <laughs> but I, I never really did it. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I was told right from the beginning, if you do that, you, you you become a stag comedian. A lot of comedians today are stag comedians, but the quality of comedians today is terrific. There's some. Brilliant, brilliant comedians. When I when I went up to Edinburgh, you know, I was amazed at how many people are comedians. Uh, a lot of them, I'd say, seventy five percent of them aren't really comedians. They're writers, right? And it's I, a different style of comedy. They seem to tell us about their day more than give us da 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 punchline. They don't they don't like doing that anymore, and that's a shame because people love it. I think Peter Kay is the nearest we've got to that. I think you've got that spot on. He's amazing, that Peter Kay. He crosses over. He, he's the one that crosses over. But if you look at them, you know they they all want to be so different. But Jack D, he's Les Dawson. Jimmy Carr, he's Bob Monkhouse. Michael McIntyre, Ronnie Corbett. <laughs> yes. Do you know what I mean? You can see the comparison. 
and yet they all want to be different. Mm. The secret is just keep them laughing. And what goes around comes around. At the moment, as we sit here, it's gone quiet at the moment, thank God. We haven't had too many passing away, but it's been quite a tough few years. Is that tough, seeing the people you love and admire pass away? Yes, it is. Um, the, um, someone who was very close to Ken and I um, was Frank Carson. Now, I don't mind telling you, I've never met anyone or seen anyone today as funny as Frank Carson. He was like the Irish Tommy Cooper. Uh, infectious. His his mission in life was to make the world laugh. Um, and we, we miss him every day. We talk about him every day. We do impressions of him every day. We got Mick Miller living up here. We've got uh, Tony Joe and Johnny Casson living up here, and uh, <laughs> we just adore Frank Carson and the old comedians. Even Bernard, you know, we talk about Bernard Manning, and uh, of course Tom O'Connor. And um, Doogie Brown are the only real two, I think, left. Jim Bowen is still alive. I don't think he's too well at the moment. God bless him. It's a bit better. We had him on actually about three weeks ago. He's had, I think, four strokes, yeah. but he is recovering. His speech is better. He'd oh. like to do a little show somewhere. Oh, I'm glad that's, of that. that's the, uh, that's the day by saying that. Yeah, that's terrific. I saw him about two years ago down in, we went to New Brighton, all of us, you know. Stan's still around and, and make. And uh, we, we did a sh show down there and a beautiful theatre in New Brighton. And we sold that out. Um, uh, and I, I loved that. It would be great to see you boys all back together doing it again. Is there any hope? I suppose the problem for you is you are literally too busy and you're not here. Well, we, we have done that. We've done that with um, a great comedian and a very nice guy, uh, Stan Boardman's son, Paul. Yes. Uh, now, he is a massive fan of the old comedians, if we dare call ourselves or categorise ourselves as that, but I suppose we are. Uh, but um, whenever we were first starting, you know, they said you wouldn't be a comedian until you're 40 or 50, you know? Mm -hmm. So just as soon as we get the hang of it, they're saying we're old. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy to become a comedian. Right. Uh, but the young lads seem to become a different type of comedian, and um, I admire that, you know, I've... Uh, that uh, Kevin Bridges and what have you, what a brilliant comedian he is for stand up, and uh, but Peter K to me is he's he's the king from moving uh, from keeping in a little bit of the old school and the new school, and he I don't think he's got any equal. If he'll ever do it again, I don't know because where would he learn to do it again? He's so famous right. and so rich. I know. And he loves people like you, and I know he embraces you. He had you on, I think, the first series of Phoenix Nights, was he? did. It? He asked me to, to open, the, open the Phoenix Club and what have you. This, <laughs> I still see him to this day coming up. My, I used to have this big Victorian house further along here in four stories and what have you, and I saw this beaten up old Datsun coming up. <laughs> and my son, both my sons are comedians. Uh, Philip has got his own comedy club here in the Cricket Club in Lytham St. Anne's about once a month. And he does very well. My other son, Mark, he's sort of given up on the on the uh, Edinburgh thing. And he got five stars and then never got never got a. But he's very much an old fashioned entertainer as well as a comedian. And they don't want that; they run away from it, you know. So he's in sort of Freddie Star mode, a wee bit like Bobby Davlo type of thing. But they don't seem to have a marketplace for that. And yet the audiences adore it. So uh, yes, yeah, so Peter came up to drive. And uh, he'd been speaking to Mark and Philip, and uh, he came in. And he said, to me, "Call me Mr. Walker." I said, "No, it's all right. Just call me Roy, and what have you?" And he said to me, um, "Would you open? The f I'm doing do this television show called Phoenix Nights, you know." And I said, "Oh." So he told me a little bit about it. I said, "It's nice, like a wheel toppers and shunters." You know, he said, "Well, it is a wee bit like that." You know what I mean? We're, but uh, there's lots of comedians on it and comedians and what have you. And I said, oh, it sounds good fun. He said, we'd like you to open it. So I said, uh, well, why don't you ask Frank to open it? Or Jim? You know, they love opening things, you know? So uh, why bring me involved? <laughs> so, so he kept on and on. He said, oh, we'll pay you, you know? And I said, no, 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 I don't want paid or anything like that. He said, well, wh why would you not do that? I said, well, I only do things for a reason, right? Eh? fun and B money you know so if I did your show would I be any more famous you know and he went you never know who 
I mean, <laughs> did we ever think what was going to happen? And my agent, luckily enough, we never took a fee, but we put a small percentage of merchandise. Wow. For years, my hall was full of money at Christmas because <laughs> he sells out. So you got the merchandise for the entire Phoenix Nights thing, a yeah. post. Oh, wow. Yeah, all the, anything that I was on. Plus, I got 100 universities out of it. Yeah, you know, and then I got nine years on Radio One with Chris Morris just through being through Peter K. So if you're listening, Peter K. Hey, by the way, I fed him. Well, we had his dinner. I've never been invited over to his house, <laughs> so, but thank you. <laughs> The Chris Moores thing is really interesting because that brought you a whole another level of fame. I mean, he got a radio audience that, again, they would dream of today. Interesting, you did that with TV, he did that with radio. Now he's on another radio station that's seemingly struggling to find its place. But when Car Park Catchphrase was on, people just loved it. And it was that type of radio where he talked to you and we believe you were in conversation with him. It was all pre-recorded. It was genius. Well, um, First of all, I have to pay tribute to Comedy Dave because all of a sudden Comedy Dave got inside my head and uh, he just thought about this flirtatious, this 70-year-old type of thing, <laughs> you know, saying he's going out with Lady Gaga and, <laughs> you know, Madonna. And uh, I'll give uh, Chris Moyles his due. He never knew what I was going to say. Right. Oh, he he wanted to respond to it, you know, yeah. and he would go, "Yeah, how you doing, Roy? What are you doing today?" You know, <laughs> well, not too much, you know. I was out last night, what have you? Really, where were you? Well, you know, Madonna. She likes to go out. And, <laughs> what you were out with Madonna? Yeah. How do you get to know her? Well, I've written all her hits. <laughs> what well, it it doesn't your name doesn't appear on the label? Well, I write under different names, you know. Uh, well, what was the last one that she sang? And uh, I said, well, if I sing it in her key, it's not going to be necessarily in tune. Okay? <laughs> so. <laughs> hands up, put your hands up. <laughs> I would do something like that there, you know. Because the white van man, he got it right away. But a lot of people go, is that really Roy Walk? <laughs> It was so what wonderful. Fun. And it went on and on. People did not get bored of it, did they? It was what fun. It was some of the best fun I've ever had. And all I would do was get on the train, go down. I'd get on the train at uh, 8 o'clock. I'd be in London at 10.30. At 11, we would do it, and I'd be on the 2 o'clock train back here for half four. I hope they gave you a nice lunch. Um, do you know they're very tight, the BBC? <laughs> They asked me to use my senior rail card. <laughs> How about that for tightness? Is that true? Yeah, but I made up for it on appearances somewhere else. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. And then we look at your life now, and you've really made it, haven't you? How do you view your career at this point? If you never worked again, in my eyes, you'd be a massive success. The fact you are doing is just testament to your incredible talent and career. Well, to tell you the truth, I pinch myself every night. I can't believe it's still ongoing. You know, when I started off, I was only 14, you know, at school and what have you. And um, it was, you know, I, everybody's got a dream who wants to do something out there that they're going to make it and what have you. I didn't make it right away. You know what I mean? I was like, um, into my 30s, you know, when I, when I got my first break. Uh, and in my forties, when I got catchphrase, so I paid my dues, you know, and uh, I'd done the rounds, and uh, I knew a thing or two. So I think having done it that way, instead of like, you know, Jim, uh, Jim Davison, who was immediately a star because he was so different, uh, and then sort of way life catches up on where he becomes. Uh, politically incorrect, if you know what I mean. He still has a marketplace, the way Bernard Manning had a marketplace, and the way Roy Chubby Brown had a marketplace. But it evaporates in today's society. You've got to know the rules, and you've got to play with the rules. Uh, it's difficult nowadays. And I guess the other thing is, if you want to be popular and the big star like that, that will come down like that. Whereas you've, in terms of comedy, just had a very successful, consistent career and you've not really looked for the peaks and therefore there have been no troughs and that's probably why you're still working. That's the problem with pop stars, isn't it? They come and they go. Yeah. There's so many genres now. Uh, 
But I like, I still like to be that little bit dangerous and what have you, you know. Um, I flew into Dublin from Norway uh, and I was doing a show in Dublin. I was in the taxi and all the buildings had yes, no, yes, no streamers. And I said, is this for Brexit or what? He went, no, it's a referendum for gay marriage. I said, what? In the south of Ireland? He went, yeah. I, I said, that is amazing that there. I said, 20 years ago, you were putting gay people in prison. You know, he went, yeah, but uh, we believe in equality. We are leaders. You know, I said, well, I'm dead proud of you. I said, you're an example to the rest of the world. He said, thanks very much indeed. I said, I suppose you'll be letting the Protestants in next. There was a long pause, and he said, "I'll get back to you on that one." <laughs> and I, I like I like to keep up to date with sort of comedy like that. I'm doing, doing gags on Trump and and Hillary and uh, all sorts of things, and uh, and and enjoying every every second of it. You know, you still write every day. Yeah, every day. Try and get one every day. You know. Brilliant. Roy Walker, it's been such a pleasure seeing you again. Thank you so much for your time. What an amazing life and career. And as we look out that window at the beautiful ocean in front of us, you're you living the, the dream. The weather you brought with you. I know. <laughs> it was all right till I came in. <laughs> <Sorry to laughs> <you again. laughs> Great to talk to you. Thank pleasure. you for your time. Thanks very much.